in the first act of the show, we talked about some really dark and evil shit. I'm going to just keep continuing with that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're here in Providence, and to me, Providence is about one thing. Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Let's give him... Isn't that, isn't that adorable, folks? A, a healthy to, face. You get to walk around all day knowing that you're in a town that is, for the rest of the world, completely identified with a agoraphobic, xenophobic, <laughs> weirdo, <laughs> incel psychopath. Yeah, it's, it, it's cool how Maine gets Stephen King, who just now on Twitter is like, the real it is Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 and you get this freak. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, because like Stephen King is like just your chill boomer uncle, you know, you can hang out with. Nice and then there's, guy. And that's like, yeah, then there's, Howard, then there's H.P. Lovecraft where if you met him at a family function, you would like do anything to not make eye contact. But, you know, you can see how he thought he was the master race. He looks like a normal person looking at himself in the back of a spoon. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, he... everyone loves a nice long skull, just a normal long skull. I wonder why he was so obsessed with fish people. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, you know, if you if you listen to the show, you might have noticed that H.P. Lovecraft does figure somewhat prominently in our own lore and mythos, because uh, for me, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is one of my major problematic faves. So I think. Here in just outside of Providence, I think it would be appropriate to pay tribute to the master. I've put together a little something for you guys and my co-hosts who may not know all of the details of his life. Yeah, Felix and I, well, Felix only reads the Quran and I only read the Financial Times. So we're jumping in this with just completely cold. I also read the Financial Times, but it has, you know, informed by my wisdom from the Quran. Right, right. Cats won't walk on... The Financial Times. People don't know that. They respect the pink. Yeah. Felix only reads the Financial Times from Marmaduke. <laughs> well, Marmaduke made a great point about the Turkish lira float the other day. <laughs> okay, so this is a segment I'd like to call Facts Concerning the Life of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. The most important thing to keep in mind as you learn about the life of H.P. Lovecraft and consider his oeuvre of work is that he really is the portrait of the proto-incel. Mm. He really was one of, like, the, he, was, he was what would become, if he were born in a different era, an alt-right Reddit guy. He was a poster. He was a poster before his time. But writing spooky stories is what you had to do before the internet. Before you could post on forums, you had to write short Can you stories. He was, he was a Reddit poll with creepypasta crossover. Can you imagine the horror of that? Instead of just like going onto your computer and just to anyone who clicks on the page, just giving them all of your wisdom about skull shapes and racial destinies, you had to sit down at a, some fucking Underwood fucking typewriter and clack out 500 pages of allegorical prose about squid monsters who are actually Italian <laughs> and then send it to like 500 incredibly shady fucking New York pulp magazine publishers they maybe one of the one of them would give you a cent for it <laughs> yeah. and, and if you want and if you wanted to like punctuate your writer's block by jacking off you had to send away to Siam for a drawing of a tit <laughs> grim times grim times indeed but, you know, if you consider his body of work, if you've read all of it, as I have, um, you, like, you're, you're struck by the fact that even though I enjoy it very much, his work featured basically all of the same themes that obsess the alt-right today. His work is all about this sort of the, the unseen threats to Western civilization and the cultural and racial you know, degeneration inherent in that. He was obsessed with, uh, yeah... Like the, the loss of Western culture and the, the, the invasion by sort of otherworldly outside forces. And he was, yeah, a, a fanatical racist and lunatic. And, you know, often when, when we discuss writers from, you know, the 1920s or a different era, you can say, and, some, you know, not without cause, that, you know, maybe we shouldn't, you know, judge writers of a different era by the same standards of today. But no... H.P. Lovecraft was fucking insanely racist, even by the standards of the fucking 1920s. Yeah. Virgil, remember, we had an idea for a, a sketch. Remember? Yes. It was like, going to be a fake documentary interviewing... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The idea was that uh, 
we, you know, we, we would have to do, uh, uh, what do you call it, reenactments of this. Yeah. But the idea was that all of Lovecraft's stories were just explicitly racist, and he just had one editor who changed, like, Italians to uh, uh, fish monster, yeah. to, the, uh, <laughs> to the deep ones, yeah, yeah. and changed, uh, uh, you all know... Of, all of the he cath- did word, find, and replace. Yes, basically. <laughs> basically. Like, and, like, all of that stuff, like the Cthulhu, Fathagan, Nog, the Log Thogoth, like that weird, you know, slur, like, speech that he does in that, those are all just explicit slurs before yeah. the editor got first pass on Maybe it. Maybe they That's- were Italian meats. <laughs> Sopraceta prosciutto. It's probably how he heard Yiddish. <laughs> yeah, the Necronomicon was originally the Quran. <laughs> it was written by quote, the, Arab, the uh, Mad Arab oh, yeah. Abdul Azrahad. Just a, a few notes on H.P. Lovecraft's completely hysterical racism. Reading here, it says um, From the start, Lovecraft did not hold all, the, all white people in uniform high regard, but rather esteemed the English people and those of English descent. He praised non-WASP groups such as Hispanic and Hispanics and Jews. Hmm. Thank however, you. however, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's nice to be appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> however, his private writings on groups such as Irish Catholics, German immigrants, <laughs> and African Americans were consistently negative. I mean, okay, the first one, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously <laughs> correct. They are the plague of this fucking. You know, you're from fucking New England. You fucking know. Irish fucking Americans are basically like the worst people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, let's dive into uh, the life of H.P. Lovecraft. Like I said, keep in mind, proto-poster of the era that we all live in now. He really, a lot of the times he's credited with uh, giving birth to the entire genre of cosmic horror. But what he really did was give, <laughs> give birth to the cosmic horror of internet posting culture and personalities. So he was born uh, in 1890, right here in Providence, Rhode Island, or right next door to here in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, wouldn't you know it, he had a sad and tragic childhood. <laughs> Who didn't back then? <laughs> yeah. Like, literally, you, you were born, you had 17 siblings, and 15 of them, like, didn't make it to age two. You somehow and got you, syphilis off of a toilet seat. Yeah. Your dad worked at a dirt factory and, like, got caught in the gears when you were nine. You're almost right, except for the fact that he was an only child. Let's get to the syphilis part. Well, yeah, by the end of it. (laughs) (laughs) So his father was a traveling salesman employed by the Gorham Manufacturing Company that developed a... (laughs) that developed a type of mental disorder caused by untreated syphilis when he was around the age of three. His dad was syphilitic Jack Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I need those. I, I, need, I need the those, leads. I need the Glenn Gary leads. leads. I need them. Do There's bugs toast? under my skin. I need the leads. <laughs> Purple monkey dishwasher. I need the leads. First prize is a Cadillac. Second prize... Treatment for your syphilis. <laughs> third, third prize is you're fired. Okay, so he developed a, uh, a mental disorder due to untreated syphilis when uh, Howard was around the age of three. In 1893, his father became a patient at the Butler Hospital in Providence and remained there until his death in 1898. I'm sure Shout out was... to the mental hospital for the 19th Yeah, we got fans of the, uh, the Butler. Every... Yo, that place is haunted as fuck, yo. <laughs> Still haunted. I, I'm sure that was a great hospital for his dad to be in. in the, at that time in the world where just every doctor was Mangala. <laughs> <laughs> Lovecraft's mother, uh, Sarah Susan Phillips, never exhibited any of the symptoms of the disease, leading to questions regarding the intimacy of their relationship. In 1969, Sonia Yo, Green... Your dad got no pussy. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing that made him dark. Like, it, it blackpilled him. He saw that his dad was cocked. In a- 1969, Sonia Green, H.P. Lovecraft's former wife, ventured that S- Susan was a, quote, touch-me-not wife, and that Winfield, his father, being a traveling salesman, took his sexual pleasures wherever he could find them. Lovecraft himself... And sometimes he fucked a squid, and that didn't affect Lovecraft at all. Lovecraft, uh, Lovecraft himself termed, called his mother at one point in a 1937 letter a touch-me-not. 
noting that after his early childhood, she avoided all physical contact with him. This is contrary to his mother's treatment uh, of a uh, young Lovecraft soon after his father's breakdown. According to, the, I mean, according to accounts of family friends, his mother doted over the young Lovecraft to a fault, pampering him and never letting him out of his sight. I'm sure that didn't warp him at all. Literally yeah. pamperings, as in diapers. Um, if, we, if we have any, like, you know, parents or soon-to-be parents in the, in the crowd, if you have a kid, you know, and you're the mom, make sure to, like, Literally never let him leave your side. He'll grow up to be a famous author like this. <laughs> awesome. After his father's hospitalization, Lovecraft resided in the family home with his mother and his maternal aunts, Lillian and Annie, and his maternal grandparents, Whipple and Roby. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. No. <laughs> no. We are indeed on our way now, Ducky. <laughs> Lovecraft later re- recollected that after his father's illness, his mother was, quote, permanently stricken with grief. He also said, as a child, he was enamored with the Roman pantheon of gods, oh. accepting them as genuine expressions of divinity and foregoing <gasps> his Christian upbringing. Oh, my Dude, God, he's, he's a, a Marvel bust uh, Twitter avatar yes, guy. Yes, this is where I'm going with this. He wa- this is proto-alt-right shit. They like the, the traditions of like Christianity upholding the West, but deep down inside they hate it because essentially Christianity uh, counsels us to love and help the weak, yeah. whereas the old pagan gods of Europe told us to kill and enslave them. Yeah. No, it's the Edward Gibbon thesis, basically, yeah. And they love, they love those guys. I, my favorite is, is, is when they have like Trajan as their fucking avatar, you know, the guy who was just fucked literally every man who he met. <laughs> Like, literally every one of them. This is even more fucking Reddit. Are you ready for this? He recalls at five years old being told Santa Claus did not exist and retorting by asking why God is not equally a myth. (laughs) Own own by your own logic. Good day, madam. I mean, you have been owned. To be fair, I think most kids actually arrive at that conclusion. Uh, They just eventually stop caring because they become adults. Some of, them be, some of them become Sam Harris fans, though. Right. No, I think that's true. It's like when you realize Santa isn't real, you do what have that moment. What else have I been lying to it's about? It's like, who else isn't real? And then you're just like, I'm not going to think about that. I'm just going to... Go, go, I was worried about it for a minute, but thankfully I hit puberty, so I'm just going to be jacking off for the next five years. Yeah, you just stay busy. You find yeah, a hobby. Exactly. And then you reach, you know, your mid-twenties, and you find out the only true thing is astrology, and you're fine. <laughs> So Cthulhu is his flying spaghetti monster. (laughs) Oh, my God. Wow. Literally is. Holy shit. Oh, my God. Whoa. Ready for more uh, epic Reddit bacon uh, drama? Yeah, what was, what was like the asshole nerd hat back then? Because everyone had to wear them. <laughs> was it like, oh, great, he's another propeller hat atheist. <laughs> <laughs> you he's know, another that hat they think looks so cool. Get a load of this guy in his fucking colonial tri-corner. <laughs> One of those trepid atheists. <laughs> yeah, the atheists back then just had a fucking Trill divot, a fucking <laughs> divot out of their skull. That's what you had instead of gauges back then. That's how the you knew. <laughs> that's how you were a scene kid in the yeah, 1800s. That was body modification. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's more uh, epic Reddit shit. At the age of eight, he took a keen interest in the sciences, particularly astronomy and chemistry. He also examined the anatomy books available to him in the family library, learning the specifics of human reproduction that had yet to be explained Mm, to him. Yeah, all those pages were stuck together. (laughs) And he found, and he found that it, quote, virtually killed my interest in the subject. (laughs) No one Yeah, women, I thought women are cool, but did you know they're full of guts? (laughs) I... I shan't be getting up in those guts, madam. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be one of those guys who lies about fucking porn stars back then, you had to be like, yeah, me and my cousin, we actually met the girl from the anatomy textbook and we fucked her. <laughs> <laughs> that was Lisa Ann. <laughs> uh, again, would it surprise you to learn he was a very sickly child who was plagued throughout... <laughs> His entire education oh, but he by seems so robust. He was plagued throughout his entire education by health crises of various kinds. Uh, 
In 1908, prior to his high school graduation, he had another episode, though this instance was seemingly more severe than any prior. The exact circumstances and causes remain unknown. The only direct record are Lovecraft's own later correspondence, wherein he described it variously being as a nervous collapse and some sort of breakdown, in one letter blaming it on the stress of high school, despite his enjoying it. Look, like, I don't know what it, happened, but it made him real weird. <laughs> Everyone seemed like their lives seemed to be broken down into episodes back then. I guess it was like the only way you could deal with the world was having a psychotic break every two years. I mean, maybe there's something to it. He got a lot done. In another letter concerning the events of 1908, he notes, I was and am prey to intense headaches, insomnia, and general nervous weakness, which prevents my continuous application to anything. He has chronic Lyme. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my god, he was on the pain internet mm-hmm. An account from He was high- a spoonie Yes, he was a spoonie He had no fucking spoons left <laughs> An account from high school classmate Described Lovecraft as exhibiting Quote, terrible tics And that at times He'd be sitting in his seat And he'd suddenly up and jump <laughs> Think how fucking boring school was back then you didn't even have a substitute teacher day where they wheeled in a TV and just let you watch a fucking movie. They yeah, al- you couldn't play Fortnite. It was awful. They also didn't know anything. So your classes would be like, all right, so it's like you got the skin, then you got the veins under there. All right, you're a doctor now. <laughs> Here's your ether. <laughs> Here's more internet uh, bullshit. Lovecraft uh, started out as a would-be journalist, joining the United Amateur Press Association in 1914. The following year, he launched his self-published magazine, The Conservative. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God! God. Failed journalist, self-published, read my Medium post, it's all there. Oh, my God. It's all there. I'm telling you. Uncanny. Holy shit. This is the blueprint. He was the old god that opened this door into our world and spawned a fucking zillion fucking awful children, awful unholy children. Bursting like spider eggs from his womb. Not only that, check this out. He was also a compulsive letter to the editor writer, which was (laughs) the early 20th century version of posting. He was in the comments section constantly. He was, he was hectoring the New York Times to talk about Italian no go no Rooney zones. <laughs> Check this out. Um, uh, in 1911, Lovecraft's letters to the editor began appearing in pulp and weird fiction magazine, most magazines, most notably Argosy. A 1913 letter critical of Fred Jackson, a prominent writer for Argosy, started Lovecraft down a path that would greatly affect his life. (laughs) Lovecraft described Jackson's stories as, quote, trivial, effeminate, and in places, coarse. Got him. (laughs) You know how that writing is coarse, but also kind of gay? Continuing, Lovecraft said that Jackson's characters exhibit, quote, delicate passions and emotions proper to Negroes and anthropoid apes. (laughs) In, the, in this time, Lovecraft was also kicked off his professional Jacks team for calling another player a Bavarian. <laughs> he wrote letters to the editor criticizing the uh, forced diversity of the film Man Boards Train. <laughs> 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 Look, they keep drawing Nancy with a bigger and bigger nose. You know what that means. <laughs> So uh, his posting uh, sparked a nearly year-long feud in the, le- <laughs> in the letters section of Argosy between Lovecraft, along with his occasional supporters, and the majority of readers critical yes. of his view of Jackson. Never stop posting! Never stop posting. Even if, I will not log off! Even if everyone hates you. And it says his occasional supporters. So he, even back then, he had a clique of fellow assholes <laughs> co-signing his fucking screen. Reads. Check this out, though. This is fucking hilarious. Um, 
Lovecraft's biggest critic was John Russell, who often replied in verse, and to whom Lovecraft felt compelled to reply because he respected Russell's writing skills. This is the Chad writer who's just <laughs> winding him up every fucking time by doing a limerick in response to his fucking impassioned pleas about anthropoid apes. Well, that he that was that was how you were like a white SoundCloud rapper back then. <laughs> I'm lyrical. <laughs> Okay, not only that, but another great thing about posting is having friends on the internet, right? Of course. People you don't know. and, yeah, then, and when band of brothers. Buddies. Yeah, people you don't know, and then one, one day you meet them and start an incredibly successful podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Called Pod Save America. <laughs> <laughs> one of his posting buddies, with whom he carried out a lengthy correspondence using the posting service, the U.S. Mail, <laughs> was Robert E. Howard who you might know as the author of the Conan the Barbarian stories. Robert E. Howard was also a, um, you know, uh, a guy obsessed with uh, masculinity. And, you know, like in the Conan stories, they extol this kind of hyperborean masculinity. And uh, Conan would often fight these sort of degenerated uh, ape species of people. You know, he was also... The real Robert E. Howard was also a complete butterball and mama's boy from Texas who lived with his mother. Check this out. He carried on a correspondence with Robert E. Howard up until the morning of June 11th, 1936. Robert E. Howard had been caring for his mother the entire time who was suffering from tuberculosis. On that morning, she was nearing the end. Howard asked one of his mother's nurses, a Mrs. Green, if she would ever regain consciousness. When she told him no, he walked out to his car in the driveway, took the pistol from the glove box, and shot himself in the head. Sorry, sorry, I thought that would be a bigger laugh line there. (laughs) (laughs) Look, it's been long enough. It's not too soon or anything. By the way, I'm looking at a picture of this guy, and you're right about being a little, little bit of a chubby butterball. He was also... Literally a fedora guy. Yes, he, he was. But everyone was back yeah, then. That was That's the, like the style. Go, but, going bit like seeing a picture of your grandfather from the 30s. You fucking MRA, PUA, PC. No, shit. no, no, no. You took off your hat for a portrait. You definitely took off your hat for a portrait. He was the guy who did not. Maybe he had a bad hairline. Here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm getting about with these two guys. Uh, they're intense wow. internet friends. Their intense internet friend, their intense yeah. posting friends, both obsessed. They're both with, fiat no, Nothing warriors. wrong with that. Yeah. They're both, but both obsessed with uh, like masculinity, racial hygiene, racial hygiene, and like the degeneration of the species. Despite being two absolute fucking dorks living with their mom, <laughs> literally living in their tubercular mother's basement. <laughs> yes, I. B- I do want to say I have always loved the phrase from back then, racial hygiene. Yeah. It implies like the existence of a racial slob. Just got you have genotypes all over the table. That's like my yeah, like, ap- my yeah. apartment, but with haplo groups. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're everywhere. He's just piling up the haplo groups. I just kick them under the couch at this point. So the horror magazine Weird Tales bought some of Lovecraft's story in 1923, giving him his first taste of literary success. The following year, he married Sonia. That was Green. weird Twitter. <laughs> and he only had like three tweets the following year also by the way uh, with uh, Shadow over Innsmouth he invented other kin <laughs> <laughs> the following year he married Sonia Green a childhood acquaintance from a wealthy Rhode Island family Lovecraft's aunts dis- disapproved of the relationship with Sonia but Lovecraft and Green were married on March 3rd, 1924, and he, he relocated to her Brooklyn apartment at 793 Flatbush Avenue. I looked this up on Google Maps today. That's in Prospect Lefferts Garden, right on the corner of Prospect Park, and the building, I went to the street view, is currently a Chinese food restaurant, a liquor store, and a hair braiding salon. Three things that would have fucking horrified H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft. Well... Lovecraft famously, a lot of his stories he wrote in the cornrows period. 
of his authorship. Yeah, but here's the thing. So, you know, we've all been listening along to these tales and making fun of H.P. Lovecraft, but now we're getting to the part where he moves to New York and fucking hates it, and Felix what? says, hold on a minute, Give, let's hear him out. <laughs> let's hear him out. Uh, look, okay, some things, like, look, they age poorly, but some ideas are timeless. That's all I'm going to say. Wouldn't you know it, his marriage broke up after two years due to uh, his wife's Ill- various illnesses. Again, everyone was fucking sick all the time back then. And financial difficulties. She relocated to Cincinnati and then later to Cleveland. Uh, her, as she, she followed work, basically. Adding to the daunting reality of failure in a city with a large immigrant population, <laughs> Lovecraft's single-room apartment later at 169 Clinton Street in Brooklyn Heights. What? Uh, yeah, Chris has walked by this theater. It's right by the Court Street Theater in Brooklyn, if you know where that is, or ever want to see a movie in Brooklyn. Uh, not far from the working-class waterfront neighborhood of Red, Fo- Red Hook. The apartment was burgled, leaving him with only the clothes he was wearing. That's literally, that theater is the theater I go to to smoke weed during a matinee. It's justice. After, after he got burgled, uh, Lovecraft famously wrote the article, How I Lost My White Guilt. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's the same thing. You get victimized by petty crime in the city yeah. once, and you develop this fantastical cosmic mythology of like racial violation and horror. He's how like, I Lost My Non-Tentacled Guilt. <laughs> I love how back then like part of being racist was being racist to Germans. Like, that's <laughs> what an insane hierarchy it was. They had a whole no, but elaborate organization. Felix is exactly right. Lo- Lovecraft hated and feared anything and anyone that was not of good old New England stock. And like Felix, too, he also hated everything about New York City. <laughs> In what, a, look, okay, you know how Hitler invented the Autobahn? Like, okay, sometimes so <laughs> bad people have good ideas. Will, was that uh, Lovecraft's only wife, or did he remarry? He never remarried. That was his only lo- wife and relationship. And so by the what? way, Alan Moore, in doing his own research on the life of H.P. Lovecraft claims that it was a celibate marriage and that H.P. Lovecraft only touched his wife one time and it was on her hand. This, yeah. this is Alan Moore, okay? That was second base. One of my favorite... Yo, get you a touch-me-not, girl. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what, Chad Posture. I don't know what you're talking about. One of my about. favorite stories about that marriage is Lovecraft was, you know, at times anti-Semitic, and he would at go times, off on these... Well, I mean, he, Will says at the beginning that, oh, he actually liked Jews, but that sounds... Like I'm sure it was like me. he said he liked them by saying, yeah, they're good with money or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would go off on these tirades about Jews while his wife is in the room, and she would have to remind him, honey, I'm half Jewish, remember? And then, oh, and don't then, feel bad for her. She married a psychopath again, so... I mean, you and made then, like, your bed, honey. And then in his arguments in the letters to the editor comments, he'd be like, by the way, I'm not anti-Semitic. <laughs> the woman I'm married to is half Jewish. And, and that I fucking never literally, touch her. And I never liter- touch her. Dude, that literally happened to that alt-right podcast guy. Oh my yeah. God, you're right. The, the, you're what right. is that, the Right Stuff podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mike Pinovich. Yeah. Mike Pinovich. It came out that his wife was like a quarter Jewish yeah. and he had to apologize to all of his listeners. I yeah. promise to do better. <laughs> but no, Amber's right. You can't really have any sympathy for the wife because at some point they went on a date and like he he panicked Asked about and ran her away and like and like you know took a scalding shower because he shook accidentally shook hands with a Cornishman. <laughs> and like if that's not a red flag, I don't know what it is. Oh Ooh. yeah, I'm a I'm a racist loser. Uh, how about I tell that to my Jewish wife, whom I'm holding hands with right now? <laughs> <laughs> Time to go stare at my hot wife, losers. I, I, what? Is, so like, if that was Lovecraft, what was like an annoying performatively woke guy back then? He like, <laughs> it was just like, oh yeah, I went to dinner with this guy, and he just made a big show about how he wouldn't shoot an Irishman on Will- sight. <laughs> <laughs> Will, Will Rogers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Will Rogers. I guess he was like, well, who's the Matt guy? Matt, the woke guy from Orange Is the New Black. Oh, I don't know. Oh, uh, McGorry. Yeah, yeah Matt, Matt McGorry. McGorry. Yeah. 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 Will Rogers is Matt McGorry. I buy that. That's yeah. a good parallel. Okay. So he, he lived in New York and uh, wrote many sh- several short stories about New York, which sort of captured his horror and disgust. At well, the place. he had a lot of time indoors. Yeah. 
Uh, this quote sums up his feelings about New York, and honestly, this is for Felix. This is dedicated to Felix here. My coming to New York had been a mistake, for whereas I, I had looked for a poignant wonder and inspiration, I had found instead only a sense of horror and oppression which threatened to master, paralyze, and annihilate me. <laughs> <laughs> two? That's two things you got right? I love how, like, for, for, for H.P. Lovecraft, like, that horror was, like, created by this deep psychic revulsion at anyone who deviated from this very narrow wasp conception of humanity. For Felix, it's because his fucking Grubhub order was 10 minutes late. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, for, no, uh, it's not bad. Lo- it's not bad. To be fair, Felix also hates the Bavarians. Oh, Lovecraft was oh, mad dude. because the ping on the telegraph line sucked. That <laughs> he couldn't play his uh, tic-tac-toe games. People were wi- He was losing to children <laughs> across the... Uh, in the Orient, celestial children at tic-tac-toe <laughs> and correspondence chess. Dude, you, dude, you are so lucky that, that the telegram service lagged my fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Like, like uh, Felix uh, will tell you guys, he will launch into these Baroque denunciations of New York. They can go on for 20 minutes. But honestly, if they had, like, Seoul, South Korea-level internet, he would never complain once. Yeah, no, I'm a simple man. Like, my, I hate, like, the high population density of New York. But it's like, you can live through anything if you know that your shots are hitting. <laughs> So after his marriage and career in New York failed, Lovecraft returned home to here, Providence, Rhode Island, and began work on all of his most well-known and well-liked stories, including The Call of Cthulhu, At the Mountains of Madness, uh, Whisper in the Dark. I could go on and on. I've, I've all shadow, of them are basically... Shadow over Innsmouth. Yeah, everyone, you could go like, or, for the title, it could just be, or, ah, an Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> Lovecraft was never able to provide for even basic expenses by selling stories and doing paid literary work for others. He lived frugally, subsisting on an inheritance that was nearly depleted by, that was not nearly depleted by the time he died. He sometimes went without food to be able to pay for the cost of mailing letters. <laughs> oh my God, he starved for posting. Dude, there are, there are, there are kids, there are un, uncountable numbers of weirdo kids in this country right now that are foregoing food to play video games yes. and post on the internet. Yes, it's like, I don't need to eat the next week. I need that, uh, that Fortnite skin. Yeah. Okay, well... I tr- need the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man Fortnite skin. <laughs> okay, well, troops aren't the only people that sacrifice. Just rail thin, but blissfully happy because you finally unlock the Logan Paul skin. On I, Fortnite. I need the zoot suit skin for my diorama. <laughs> Eventually, he was forced to move to meager lodgings with his surviving aunt. Oh, he, wow. Why does he need an How? older woman with him at all times? Because like, he's a weird incel fail son that he needs, needs to be someone doted on. to bring him Mount this shitty, Code Red at all times. This, this, this shitty apartment is okay, but what it really needs is a weird, looming, hectoring aunt. <laughs> Yo, I'm about to go beast mode on the Prussians. I need my aunt there, though. (laughs) He was also deeply affected by the suicide of his friend and correspondent, Robert E. Howard. In early 1937, he was diagnosed with cancer of the small intestine and suffered from malnutrition as a result. He lived in constant pain until his death on March 15th, 1937 in Providence. And according with his lifelong scientific curiosity... He kept a diary of illness until close to the moment of his death. He even posted about dying. <laughs> okay, but what was his cat's name? You're not going to oh. trick me with this okay, one, Okay, look, look. You are not... The oh, people I'm, t- need I'm too to know. smart. When you're on the home, when you're on the way home, and you're looking up the other thing that we <laughs> alluded to... But so Lovecraft say. had a black cat. It's fine. Look yeah, it up on the fine. way home. The cat is also featured in one of his best stories, Rats in the Walls. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> what, so, uh, uh, didn't you try to get somebody by like, making them name Bobby Schmurter's big song? No, Matt, that's what Matt did to me last night. Oh, Matt, how did you even know what that song was? You looked that up to try to get No, Will. no, I thought Matt was trying to get me because I made a reference. No, I literally was asking. No, no, I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I should No, it's not a trick. He's just guileless and has never heard a rap song that was made after 1988. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, yeah, wait, hold on a minute. Stone Cold Rhyming by Young MC came out in, I think, 1992. 
Yeah, when we're off stage, we're just trying constantly conspiring to deceive each other, trick each other into saying various cuss words and racial slurs. <laughs> okay, gang, that was facts concerning the life of one Howard Phillips Lovecraft. <laughs>